ruptured my left Achilles tendon, and I'm uh, sincerely thankful that that happened because it was like five years after that, I'm uh, lecturing as a quote unquote running expert and it put me down the rabbit hole of all this stuff. You can put a pacemaker in someone's heart, which is just an electric signal to keep the uh, AV node going to keep their heartbeat. We're electric things. Right. Right? When are you ever gonna build a house not on level? So we gotta get into the neurological signaling. So my cerebellum has to tell my motor cortex, fire glutes first. Really think about the bones are floating in the muscles, because they are. They're not stacked on top of one another. There's approximation everywhere. When you run out of approximation, you're in trouble. We need to replace your joint. So you're actually floating inside your muscles, walking around, chewing that for a few hours. You are listening to the Optimal Performance Podcast. The OPP is brought to you by Natural Stacks, makers of 100% natural and open source supplements designed to help you live optimal. For more information on how to build optimal mental and physical performance into your life, go to naturalstacks.com. And of course, keep it right here listening to the OPP. Brian Muncy is, is probably the smartest guy I know. Trust me, Muncy is the nutrition guy. Ryan Muncy's out there trying to make the world better for all of us. The Optimal Performance Podcast is bold, edgy, creative, entertaining, and epic. Brian Muncy is my go-to guy. Brian Muncy is he's the first guy I call. He's making people's lives better. Brian Muncy's an innovator. All right, guys. Really, really fun episode for you today. Uh, I love doing the in-person shows. Got a chance to go to Winchester, Virginia and visit Scott Dolly at Evolution Human Performance and Rehabilitation. Scott is an amazing person, uh, an incredible human being. What an amazing Saturday morning I had with him. Uh, so Scott is really, really smart. You're going to find that out very quickly. Uh, like I said, owner and CEO, founder of Evolution Human Performance and Rehab. Uh, he is a manual therapy and ISTM specialist. That is I-A-S-T-M, Instrument Assisted Soft Tissue Mobilization, who utilizes biomechanical movement analysis to locomote imbalances and dysfunctions in the human body. Scott is a national and international speaker and educator in the field of sports medicine. He's authored courses on uh, this ISTEM uh, instrument and in, instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization and advanced training science. Uh, he also serves as the peak performance columnist for a martial arts illustrated magazine in the UK. Uh, through his work reaches over half a million people worldwide. He's got 15 years of experience studying, working with the human body works with thousands of clients every year. And like I said, Evolution Human Performance and Rehab is in Winchester, Virginia. It's right outside of DC, about 45 minutes away. Uh, Scott's undergraduate degree is in biology and physics. He's got a master's in athletic training, tons of certification, Reiki. Um, the, the, I don't even know where to begin, guys. There's so much with this. So uh, one of the things that we did while I was there was I got to experience the scraping which is the version of instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization that Scott practices. Um, and you'll hear some of the stuff that he does with that, but I got to experience it firsthand. And in my years of health and fitness and taking care of myself, I've gotten to work with a lot of people who do body work. Uh, what Scott did was amazing. And, uh, I'm recording this intro the day after doing it. And I cannot tell you guys how great I feel today. As you guys will hear on this show, Scott has the ability to weave in and out, sort of tie the, the dots and connect Eastern and Western uh, like nobody I've ever seen before. And I think uh, that's why I highlight his undergraduate work in both biology and physics. He has been trained in this. He understands you know, how these things are at play in our world and in our bodies and to be able to marry sort of Eastern philosophy with energy flows and, and chakras and key uh, to marry that into, you know, the biomechanics and, and some of the, the modern Western stuff that, that, that we have access to now. Uh, you know, Scott speaks on running form and, and technique. And, uh, you know, he, as you'll hear, he can blow you away with his knowledge of biomechanics and neurology and things like that. So, uh, you know, he, he's, 
like I said, it's it's the marriage of the two that just blows me away. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I enjoyed talking to Scott, spending the day with him. A couple of housekeeping notes for you guys. Uh, because we'll talk about recovery at the end of this episode, um, Scott mentions the importance of uh, providing your body with the raw materials that we need for recovery. So I'm going to hook you guys up with a Natural Stacks coupon code for our protein powder. Uh, the Natural Stacks Natural Protein, as you know, or if you don't know, is a two to one blend of grass fed whey protein and grass fed collagen. It has 500 milligrams of colostrum per serving, and the fourth ingredient is either vanilla bean or Ecuadorian cacao powder, depending on which flavor you choose. That's it. Those are the only four ingredients. No fillers, no preservatives, no sweeteners, no sugar, none of the stuff you don't want, just all of the things that we want to get in our body so that we can help uh, you know, maximize nutrition. So the code will be Scott, S-C-O-T-T, Pro, P R O, Scott Pro. Um, all you got to do, go to naturalstacks.com, type in that code at checkout, and you will save 25% on your order of natural whey protein. Um, next up on our order of housekeeping, review time. Go to natural, or not natural stacks, go to iTunes and leave us a five star review. Let us know how much you like the OPP. When I read your review on the air, I will hook you up with a uh, free natural stacks care package. This one is from Roberto Campi. Must listen for any biohacker. Ryan consistently finds amazing guests, explores new areas of research, prepares well for each episode to help explain complex ideas to audience, and comes across as genuine. I have found at least one or two gems to apply to my own life on nearly every episode. Well done, Ryan, and keep it up. Roberto, thank you, sir. Um, appreciate your feedback and your support and listening. Um, thank you for allowing us to be a part of your journey. Shoot me an email, ryan at naturalstacks.com. We, we will hook you up with a little care package. Um, last order of business. Guys, share this. You're going to hear things that you want other people to know. Um, there's an easy way to share it. You can grab the link on our blog post, share the blog post, go to uh, whether you listen on iTunes or SoundCloud or Stitcher, they all have little links, grab those links, share the episode, share the podcast itself, or you can kind of be a little uh, sneaky and, and aggressive uh, the way I like to do it well, because it's my show, but I grab my friend's phone and I subscribe them to the OPP when they're not looking. Yeah. Pretty sneaky, isn't it? Uh, so yeah, anything you guys can do to help us spread the word, we are grateful. Uh, appreciate you spending your time here with us today and enjoy the show. Uh, Scott and I were in the middle of conversation. Uh, we didn't do any mic checks or intro, so we're going to pick it up in the middle of uh, sort of a, a conversation leading into the actual podcast where you're going to hear Scott talking about some of uh, the reasons that he moved away from clinical practice and into doing his own thing. I'm, the biggest thing is that I am not fighting the stress of, um, I was denied any more treatments one time. I have several of these stories because I got range of motion within normal limits and pain below three in a recreational runner. And they denied any more treatments after three visits. And I was like, well, what for? So they said, you know, we deny any more treatments. She's like functionally this or this. So you got to write a whole thing that says why she uh, isn't. And the response that we got in writing, part of that response was that running wasn't an activity of daily living. Because I was like, she still can't run. We still need to do work. Right. And that was one of the last, I was like, you know, what about like running to get your kid because they're about to get hit from by a car? What about running for your life because you're being attacked? And I was like, I, I talk about this in other seminars. I'm like, how far away have we gotten people? Running's not an ADL? Huh? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so right, what's, what's more frustrating to you about this? The within normal range yep. or normal, acti normal daily activity? Like, because both of those are things that are, constructs of the medical system to fit uh, uh, billing for, for yes. insurance. Yeah. But I mean, I could have a testosterone that's, you know, 251. Yeah. I'm technically in that 250 to whatever range. Right. So I couldn't get HRT. Right. Or, you know, somebody could walk but can't run. Yeah. That's not quality of life. But it's normal. Well, that's uh, so it's it's one of the I was joking with one of my interns. I was like, the worst thing you could call me is normal. <laughs> right. So it's like we have um, on just a definition side of things. We have miscontrived the words normal and average. 
average has become normal, and that is not true at all, and that is holding back our optimal performance in even rehabilitatively. So it's like when you look across, so it's a, there was that NPR um, story a few years ago about the J spine and the S spine from like the doctor out in California or she, research scientist or something. I might have butchered that. It's something like that. I think she was educated and she went around the world and was like, oh, other cultures have J spines and they don't have the prevalency of back pain that we have here in the United States. And we have an S spine. She commented on, if you look at this textbook, medical textbook from like, you know, I think 17, 1800, she took snapshots of medical textbook. The S spine is getting worse, but we're still calling it normal. Right. So that's the whole, it's actually the word normal is the worst part I have about that. And it's average. And you, we need to actually say, here's normal. And then if, well, you know. <laughs> it's like we're grading society on a scale. And the this, and this scale is, is becoming increasingly less healthy. Yes. Yes. Because we're, conf you know, it's like if we, we need to have like a, a self-check system to go, hey, we are all under normal right now. But we're average. Yeah. Which you can feel okay about that. Yeah. Go ahead and catch your diabetes and your cancer. And well, speaking of um, uh, scale and, and normal, you said something before we started. Uh, you did some amazing work on me today, uh, so thank you for that. You're welcome. And, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, some of what we did. Uh, and, and I'm an open book, so if there's anything that you want to use from what we did this morning with sure. me as an example, feel free. Great. Um, but before we, we went in the room and started doing that stuff, you said something, and I actually put it in my notes, and I think it's a great jumping off point. Cool. Um, you said you can tune a human the same way you can tune a guitar. Yes. So uh, elaborate on that a little bit. Okay, so when you look at the uh, chakra energy system that's kind of been um, felt or experienced in the yoga world or more of an Eastern traditional uh, practice, you know, there's, there's energy centers w uh, within us of how we pull energy up from the earth and then how oh, that's like our manifestation current, and then how an inspiration current kind of uh, comes down from a, a higher conscious level. And then there's energy centers, and you can actually do these uh, simple little drills of like, oh, e, and feel resonance at a different place in yourself. So when you think about like, I love asking myself, the older I get and the more stuff that I create, I go, who thought about that first? And we, so you just think about like, you know, it's these monks just sitting around really just getting in tune with their bodies and feeling, they were like, hey, you getting this? This was different. That was something different. And we have singing bowls, right? So then like this whole like resonance frequency kind of thing was actually discovered, but they weren't calling it resonant frequency and they weren't, it was just part of them. Right. They were just self-discovery. They were biohackers, OGs. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we joked about this when I was on the right. table and, and you were talking about some of the, the key gong stuff. Right. And, you know, you, you mentioned like, you know, thousands of years ago, the guy out in the field discovering the best way to punch. Right. Uh, just from feel and optimal, just through, you know, I think there was such a level of self-honesty back then that we have kind of became disconnected with of, you know, your ego wants to have the right answer, not like let's discover the right answer together and marvel at it. Like, well, I thought this openly, not as an agenda arguing kind of thing, like, well, no, well here, check this out. Oh yeah, well, if we take the first part of what you just felt in this, now let's both of us play with that for a week and feel that. And it was just honest self-discovery, which just threw in of however many participants, they were doing research, it was standardized, they didn't have an IRB certificate, <laughs> but it was getting done. It was... Can you imagine those guys going to ask the IRB, like, hey, uh, this is what I'd like to do. Yeah, right, um, right, right. You know, can I have your permission? Can I have your permission to do it? Right, so, it's, so, you know, so on that you know, kind of level, um, just to bring in to maybe uh, validate the point to some other listeners that are like, yeah, that's that foo-foo stuff. Stuff, like Ben and I kind of comment because in, in a certain world it is and then once you get into the deeper levels and the for real people about it uh, it's not it's real stuff uh, so when you look at acupuncture and a lot of the that's that's probably the biggest forefront of where they've done eastern and western research on acupuncture one of the things they found is that a lot of the acupuncture needle points are actually nerve plexus points in our nervous system and it was like huh what an interesting correlation right. that maybe that needle at that point is interfacing something larger kind of inside of you and it's um, you you can put a pacemaker in someone's heart, which is just an electric signal to keep the uh, AV node going to keep their heartbeat. We're electric things. Right. <laughs> right. You know, so there's there's this system um, and then all electricity. Then you actually, that, that's where physics comes in because now it's no longer this opinion-based thing of whale sound foo-foo stuff. It's like, oh, okay, we're talking about current and transduction and okay, now we have some science to base it on. And this, this is why I was so excited to come up here and, and meet with you, talk to you and get you on the show because you know, when the very first thing, you know, obviously I heard you on Ben's Ben Greenfield's podcast. For you guys listening, if you haven't caught Scott on that one, go back and check that out. I'll put a link to it on the show notes. Um, but 
Your undergrad is in biology and physics. Yes, sir. You have extensive, uh, you, have, you have master's degrees, you, you've got extensive research and, and certifications and, and qualifications. But to me, going back to that, that's sort of the foundation of your education. And very few people kind of marry those two. And, and to me, that's like, that's where the Eastern and the Western kind of come together. Like you are, you, you called yourself the, the posture police. Oh, uh, right. And, you know, you, you are, I'll call you a biomechanical Nazi. You, know, you, you understand everything that's going on, you know, from a movement standpoint, you know, from a performance standpoint, you know, we're sitting inside of your, uh, your, your amazing facility here that, you know, most people would say looks like a CrossFit gym. So, you know, for, for people who just listen to that first answer and, and you know, they want to say like, oh, it's, it's woo woo, it's, it's right. esoteric, but it's, it's not like you more than anybody can can kind of marry all of those things, and it's yeah. it's so cool to see. Uh, uh, so perfect example: the question that you have on your certification test that you've written all right. for people to do epic. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, I forget how the question was, but you, they have to people who take this. They, they have to understand all the anatomy, yep. and they have to answer the question of you know describe the the motor sequence. Yeah. So take us through that, just so our listeners can a understand right. you know from brain to muscle contraction yeah. and movement, yeah, yeah. but also give an idea for them of, of how you understand. I think it's a great example, right? If we're going to talk about pouring energy into ourselves. Um, so just, just to uh, tie in that last piece, so the, the sh you have seven chakras in your body and to tune them, it's actually C, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. Perfect. So that's from root to crown. That's the note of that chakra. Say that one more time. C, D, E, F, G, okay. A, B. Okay. Just start at C and put A and B at the end. Okay. And then there's your seven chakra system. Right. So, um, you know, when you can kind of feel things like you, people that are musically inclined can hear a note and go, oh, that's note. Right. So then how, if you just have some science-based knowledge behind you and go, oh, that's note. Or I, I did, this was actually in my undergrad psychology class. I did a whole research thing with the singing bowls where this wasn't for uh, anything, extra points for science. I just did it. Um, I brought the bowls in and I made this whole questionnaire about where do you feel these in your body to see how many people could actually feel the singing bowl at a different area. It was amazing how many people started, like actually had some Right. It's a different note. Each bowl is a different note, yeah. and that's a different resonant frequency and stuff. So if, if we just, just to put the extra mechanical piece onto that, where they're actually notes, right. right? To now understand that, like, if that's playing around you, you can feel the vibrations of it, right? right? So it's like if I, um, we do the whole, like, the you know, here, let's hold hands and then hold the electric fence. <laughs> right. We're from the country. Right. As you <laughs> yeah, right. Scott's from West Virginia. I'm from Virginia. We have, we've talked extensively about, you know, farming and... and Bow hunting and, and, and yeah, bow hunters and, right. and all kinds of redneck Virginia, West Virginia stuff. Yeah, we, we will spare you guys that because we want you to think we're <laughs> intelligent people. Yeah. Um, so then, when you get to how the current is running through you, so when you look at the neurological signal of how your muscles contract and what order they contract in, we have a common saying here that's called muscle memory. <clears throat> there is no such thing as muscle memory. That muscle is just a twitch thing that is sitting there, ready to be hit with current and told what to do. Um, if it gets stuck to the thing beside it, it doesn't memorize it. It's supposed to f move in that other direction. It's gonna move now stuck to the thing beside it. Our motor cortex is what actually stores those patterns. Um, when you go to grab a doorknob to turn it, there was probably 12 different muscles that just actually fired in a sequence from start to finish of you turning a doorknob. And you could close your eyes and turn it. You could do all this other stuff. You could be texting on your phone and turn it. And it's how can we have this dichotomy of not paying attention to doing stuff? It's a stored pattern. So if it's not muscle memory, what is it? It is a, your cerebellum is the highest order function. So that signal of the EPIC test. EPIC is Evolution Performance Instructor Certification. Uh, I wrote it out of necessity because I needed to train people to work in my facility. And uh, I've gotten a little bit ahead of the game in a couple places. So, you know, I wrote this, uh, it's a pretty intensive course, but when we get to the motor sequencing movement patterning aspect of it, uh, the question says from, you know, upper motor uh, level all the way to muscle contraction, what is the, the, the physical structures that the signal passes 
through to make the muscle contract. Ser and this is, you know, you could be a super neurology person and be like, well, there's a couple other things. We're, this is deep enough for me and my coaches, I feel. Right. Uh, cerebellum, motor cortex, spinal cord, peripheral nerve, motor neuron, and then the actual, that's where it attaches to the muscle. Why I make a big deal out of motor neuron is because within the first two to four weeks of training, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, what's happening? Neurological adaptations. Right. <laughs> so we'll actually, some of our hashtags, and we're just our own little thing here going, right? We, I can show you posts where we've had members post hashtag motor neuron gains. Because <laughs> they know it's Neuro too- Neurological yeah. adaptation. Neurological adaptation. I'm, I'm not actually stronger, I'm just better at this movement pattern. <laughs> what? And they're psyched about that? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we get amped about that real geeky stuff. Uh, <laughs> but it plays a role in that, right. like, you know, so when you look at, and you're battling your squat or you're battling getting your glutes to work in your squat, it's one of the uh, primary foundations of squat. Like we had a little conversation earlier about, you know, uh, babies and how they grow. Squatting. I just read an article from Martial Arts Illustrated that that's one of our main patterns is squat, not stand. Um, stand gets there, squat happens first. But that if you are quad dominant, meaning your quads kick on before your glutes, mm -hmm. then that's gonna pull you forwards out of your heels onto the balls of your feet. Now that's gonna shift my center of mass forward, my quads are gonna dominate. And now with my VMO and everything contract, I actually stand up with my butt going out and my knees turning into each other in a valgus angle. We know that knee valgus is how you rupture your ACL. Uh, if your glutes kick on first, they posteriorly tip your pelvis, they externally rotate your femurs. Now when my quads kick on second, they stand me up. Right. And it's really that big of a difference. If I watch somebody squat and they're quad dominant, this is where we kind of mess up. Also, I train my coaches. Um, there's different level professionals out there. It's just kind of what it is. Some people, not the greatest, and they're just kind of throwing stuff on the wall. Other people are looking at the people that are doing the cutting edge stuff, and they're, they're mimicking, they're learning, they're doing that stuff. And some people are looking at the top athletes and saying, well, what are they doing? And, and it's uh, uh, unfortunate how many people do that, because, well, who is that top athlete gonna go to for help then? So I look at like the laws of physics, and it's like, if, if I'm gonna watch you move and you're an Olympic athlete and I need to take five tenths of a second off, how am I gonna shave that? Well, there's nobody else to look at to see how they're doing it. You're the person doing it. Right. We gotta get into physics and biomechanics <laughs> and say this is how you're gonna get that five tenths of a second off. Uh, so if you just watch somebody squat and they're quad dominant, they might be one of the best in the world, but my God, I can bet you I can get you 20 pounds because you have three glutes on each side and you're not using any of them. That's like six of your friends saying, come help me lift this thing. <laughs> not to mention position is power. So not only do you have six more friends lifting it, all y'all are in a better position to perform the work. <laughs> yeah. uh, so there's some simple uh, explanation from chakras to exact pathway. Uh, so it, it really does become a motor sequence stored in your motor cortex, 3,000 to 30,000 repetitions to build or unbuild those. And we are constantly developing those. That's why I uh, always talk about self-awareness. Mm -hmm. Self-awareness is probably the number one human characteristic you can develop, become self-aware. What position is your hip in? What position is your shoulders in, right? right. You know, we have this, Oh, we have our hands on hip rule here. Uh, you've shared it that you did it at your facility awesome, which is just, uh, again, I'm a fan. Uh, if uh, you're just turning into Ryan's stuff, uh, I'm a fan. He's won me over, look at his podcast, subscribe to it. The man knows what he's doing. Um, people he had to say that. I wouldn't let him on the podcast. It was on the contract. It was fine. I, you know, we're cool. <laughs> the... If you put, if you shorten something for six hours a day every day and you never stretch it, why would it become looser? So you and I, before we, uh, this is a, another conversation we had earlier. I, sometimes I think I just need to like record my entire time. <laughs> it's just, here's the mics, let's go. Yeah. I'll sort through it later. But you, you were telling me a story about um, a three, six and nine year old that were in your facility oh, yeah, doing good. an overhead squat with a PVC pipe. And, yeah. and the, the three year old had her, uh, her ass was all the way on her heels. Yep. Uh, yep. And then the, the six year old was not quite there, but not quite in a flawed movement pattern. Yep. And then the nine year old could barely get to 90 and had all kinds of flaws. And it, it you know, we were talking about that as an amazing illustration of, of how quickly our society and our modern lifestyle is moving us away from these standards of movement and this quality of life that we should have. Without a doubt, I mean, you walked in and one of the first things you said is like, oh, you got limbs on too, <laughs> right? When are you ever gonna build a house not on level? 
<laughs> Scott and I both wear Lems, the shoe, L-E-M-S. Uh, we'll put a link to that. <laughs> yeah, it's an awesome company. Uh, so it's kind of one of those things. So that again, that by so at, at three at, at three years old, her overhead squat was beyond perfect, and we actually had to show some stability because her butt kept touching the floor and the back of her heels, and we'd be like, hold a little bit of a posture. The six-year-old could actually hold that real good bottom of the squat position that kind of looked like like yeah, that's that closer to where your sister is in depth and looseness would be the optimal squat. And then the nine-year-old probably started school at five, like most of us, uh, sitting. We've known this forever in Western culture. So it's amazing how much research Western society medicine doesn't listen to. Sitting puts the most pressure on your L5-S1 out of any other position. Uh, we know sitting is the new smoking. There's research on that. You can look at blood pressure, cholesterol. There, the statistics are there if you sit over this many hours a day. That, that's, I told Scott when he was treating me to go back and listen to the podcast that I did with Aaron Alexander from Align. That's actually the name of that episode, Sitting is the New Smoking. So <laughs> Scott, go listen to it. And you guys, the OPP listeners, if you have not yeah. heard that episode, go back and check it out. Yeah, like, so there's some more overlap we always talk about. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's... If was, I get people to understand money because everybody understands money. Spend more money than you make every day and you're gonna end up broke. Uh -huh. If you shorten and tighten more than you function and mobile every day, you're gonna end up broke. Right. Everybody different kind of broke. Right. But you end up broke. Yeah. You know, so it's a um, great analogy. Yeah. yeah. I think most people could, could relate to that, wrap their heads around that. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's not muscle memory. It's actually a neural circuitry thing. It's a, it's a pattern stored in the uh, motor cortex. It really is. When we have, this is, this is that, that's when it becomes, uh, that is the connection point of like, if I say something to you and you confidently know what it is, go do a kettlebell swing. Okay, cool. Now tell someone who doesn't even know what a kettlebell swing is. Right. Uh, um, what's a kettlebell swing? Or like when I when we have these uh, kind of like motor dominant people and I'm like, squeeze your shoulder blades together back and down so that your upper traps are soft. And they're sitting here squeezing rhomboids and upper trap going like this. And I'm like, no, can't you tell that you're contracting your upper traps? So this is one of the things you're talking about with the whole like uh, posture police and stuff and the self-awareness is that, you know, Penso once, uh, you've developed self-awareness to like such a point. If I came in here, like, like people, I point out to people all the time, like, hey, your hands are on your hips. They're like, oh, I forgot again. We all laugh, they do burpees. The other one is, you know, uh, for the moms that are listening, you have a baby hip and that hip, the baby hip's the hip you keep your baby on. And that hip is most likely the hip that you also kick out to the side, put your hands on your hips, leaning into that one hip and talk to your friends. Now guess which hip gets replaced when you're 60? The, the hip, because you've just been hanging out on the capsule for 50 years. Mm -hmm. So again, getting out of mainstream medicine, having to be um, you know, just dictated by insurance and ADLs and six week protocols. I've been able to work with the populations through so much time to really work through all this stuff. And they're like, I don't have any hip pain anymore. And I don't, because we prevented it. You're not going down that path anymore. So when you look at self-awareness and you didn't understand, you, you didn't catch yourself sinking in your hip. You didn't catch yourself putting your hands on your hips. To me, that's like somebody coming in here and yielding like a gun or something and then being like, hey man, you got a gun on your hands and you're pointing at people. Oh, oh, I didn't even know. I, I couldn't even tell. I didn't even know I did that. I like got I didn't see my hand. Right. It's like, you don't know, you didn't know at this moment in time where three of the four limbs you have <laughs> extremity, you didn't know what position they were in. Right, right. <laughs> could, could we be any more lost? Like that's how far of right here in the moment, self-aware we are, is that we don't know where we're, our arms and legs are at any given moment. I have to point that out to people and make them do burpees because they forgot again. So self-check, <laughs> you guys listen, where are your limbs, what are they doing? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, all right, so, so we've got the, the sort of the electrical connection with you know the chakras and the, the motor units okay. and, and movement. On the, on the biomechanical side now, you know, we spent, I don't know how long it was, hour and a half, two hours, yep. maybe doing some soft tissue mobilization. That's, yep. that's one of your specialties. Talk to us a little bit. So it's it's I-A-S-T-M. Yep. What does that stand for? And how do you see that fitting into the bigger picture? Awesome. And, and then we'll dive deeper into, you know, sort of the scraping and all that. I love it. So there's uh, within the realm of, uh, you know, working with the body, like you just said, soft tissue mobilization. And then we said eye stem. So a soft tissue mobilization, like we were talking about uh, the one uh, body work uh, practitioner that you had that you used to go to who would just like grab the muscles and move them. That's a soft tissue mobilization. I'm moving, I'm getting it apart from the stuff around it. Um, then there is like 
Ephthorage, Petrosage, which is the big strokes everyone's experienced when they saw a massage therapist. And then the eye stem is instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization. Okay. So that like it, it really fits the same construct of what we know of I'm taking a uh, surgical stainless steel tool. Um, I use hoff grips here. They're just they're you know, it works. I'm a scientist like you could actually use a butter knife. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, go to a prof I, I tell these people a lot. Go to a professional mechanic and see if they have tools from Walmart. Uh, like so it's, it's like go to a professional tactical, um, you know, seal and see if he can tell you the weight of the knife in his hand. See if he can, t you see what I'm saying? There's yeah. just a quality I, I, that's I live there. I in Virginia Beach, um, and, and for listeners of the show, you know that I'm lucky enough to hang out with a few special forces operators, and, and I can tell you for a fact that you know, they're not using shitty equipment. <laughs> Most of them are making their own modifications. Right, because uh, we figured it out. Like, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a uh, special agent. There's actually some uh, um, awesome training combines right around here, uh, and Summit Point is one of them. So I work with one of the head firearm instructors there, and I've trained actually we, uh, that training facility knows about Evo now. So nice. as each class comes through, um, I have uh, helped train several special agents that are around the world helping us out right now. They've come through this facility, awesome. so I'm kind of proud of that. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool, the gains, they've got, like we put 60 pounds on one of their back squats. So that, yeah, this isn't, um, you know, when you look at- not, you, That's not a neurological game? Yeah, well, so, so here's the cool part, because like we just talked about like biomechanics yeah. and like now that part, but the soft tissue part, how does that do it? Well, if you have each muscle, for those that don't know, is like this huge thousands of pieces of spaghetti, just kind of listeners out there, visualize your muscles as thousands of pieces of spaghetti. And that spaghetti needs to contract and lengthen. Now take 40% of that spaghetti and ball it all up and tie it in a knot. Now, if we were to attach something on each end of that spaghetti and you know, 40% of it on the left side is balled up and tied in a knot, one, the whole unit as a self can't generate as much force, 40% of it is scarred down and it can't contract correctly. Now the gate hinge or the fulcrum on each end of it, right, if I had, uh, if we had a rope going over here and I took the left side of that rope and I pulled it further to the left, the thing going over the ledge is gonna pull to the left also. Yeah, so if you guys are trying to visualize this, I think it's important to note that, you know, that first visual of all those pieces of spaghetti, that they're uncooked, and you're looking at sort of a cross-section of that. Yeah, it's, uh, so if you think about your knee, and this is something that uh, one of my coaches was doing a reverse lunge, and he came in like, yeah, he just tweaked his knee a little bit, and, you know, we got deeper into the physiology of what was going on, but basically, when we sleep at nighttime, stuff sticks together. Uh, when we move incorrectly, we form patterns where we, we, we have so much more control to shape our bodies than we're aware of, but what can happen is vastus lateralis. So think about your quadriceps, guys. Think about your knee. Come up from your knee about three inches and go out to the outside of it. Most people listening to an Optimal Performance Podcast probably know what an IT band is. They know what quads are. Vastus lateralis is your lateral quad, if that's a little deeper for you. Uh, the vastus lateralis gets stuck to the IT band at the distal part of it next to the patella, so that you have this, imagine this big knot three inches above your patella where the muscle pulling your patella is hooked to the IT band to the right of it, it's gonna start pulling your patella lateral off the side of your trochlear groove and right there is patella femoral syndrome. There's your patella tracking stuff. So we gotta get into the neurological signaling. So my cerebellum has to tell my motor cortex, fire glutes first. Right, so and that's the problem with like a lot of people would say, all right, well, and, and this will be another question yeah. down the road with, because I wanna talk about the difference between uh, soft tissue mobilization and say foam roll. Yep. But like most people would say, all right, I'm gonna foam roll or I'm gonna do whatever technique to get yeah. rid of that, that adhesion uh, in the moment. But if you don't pattern the new movement, then it's just gonna go right back to the other. So, so you have to have that physical yeah. soft tissue work, but then you also have to have the neurological rewiring. Without a doubt, because you know, nine times out of 10, that was an insidious onset over time because that's the way you walk up and down your steps. People need like, so uh, anyone out there who has that hyper focus in a gym, I'm gonna take some pre-workout supplement and my form is dialed and stuff is good. And then they go for the rest of the 23 of the 24 hours and they're biomechanically out of line, their posture sucks, they're not moving correctly, but in the gym, they're a stud. You're 23 hours in a deficit every day, right. you've worked out seven hours a week and 161 of the remaining ones, you don't move correctly and you don't do, so it's like we need to take our gym minds to the rest of the world right. and practice, practice kind of that. But yeah, so then that's where 
just kind of helping people build, you know, as we go. So we would take the instruments, I'd take the tools, and I would actually work and get vastus lateralis unadhered from the IT band. And then I'll, just like you just said, if all I do is squat quad dominant again, well, it's just gonna form right back. Right. So now I take that opportunity and I get my glutes working first and now fire my quads, my patella stays in the trochlear groove and we have prevented patellofemoral syndrome from happening. So one of the important things that, that you pointed out to me when I, I, I saw I got to watch you do this work on your coach yep. and, and you pointed this out to me with him and then on as you were working on me as well, most adhesions are not within the same muscle. They're one muscle to the other. Correct. So that was that was interesting. I was not aware of that. Can you explain how that happens? Or uh, yeah, it's kind of one of those things where like you look at, you know, like uh, uh, the, I always love to give respect to people before me. I think I've had so much of my own information kind of pirated out and not giving me credit for it that I'm like, I'm going to do a very good job all the time of talking about people before me, you know? So it's, right. you know. Uh, you're Kate, so, I mean, you're a humble guy. Like, you know, like, <laughs> hey, I'm not inventing this stuff. Let's give credit where credit's due. Totally. We all, we all build. Um, and, and then around, if you were to, to get into that consciousness level of right. that, it's always five or six people around the world is the first ones, yeah. you know? So go ahead and say, well, you did it in April and I did it in March. What good is that going to do? Y'all were in different countries across the globe. You both thought of it around the same time right. because you were honest self-discoverers looking at research and going, hey, this and this, and you're making connections. So when you look around and you see uh, K-Star developing some of his own work and really figuring out the rest of it, um, and then Thomas Myers really with Anatomy Trains coming out, from just a massage therapist, really linking stuff together and biomechanical fulcrums of bony attachment sites of how that's leveraging tissue to the left or right of it. Uh, when you you get into getting the adhesions out of the trough to trough stuff, my work taught me that. You know, I just through my work, so I was never taught that. Explain it was just trough to trough. Okay, so if you look at the quadriceps, that's a muscle group that is vastus lateralis, vastus intermedius, vastus medialis, and then distally vastus medialis obliquus. Each one of those muscles actually has a trough in between it because it's bony attachment tendon, muscle belly tendon, bony attachment for each one of the muscles. And then each muscle is its own muscle. We've defined it as its own thing. But in cadaver lab or in many of us, if you try to you know, find palpating your own quadricep, you'll be like, okay, that's, I'm on a muscle. And then you'll just hit a groove. See like right there. I just pushed over vastus medialis. So Ryan and I are face to face right now. So I'm actually just showing him like, now I'm not in the groove, I'm in the groove. And now if I were to work this groove, you're gonna find these cross bridges and stuff that are going to be painful and you're going to be like what is that i didn't know that was growing there like yeah, that hurts and those are the adhesions, are those the are the adhesions right. there to there so within themselves the muscles are always muscles so that pack of spaghetti thing now think about a little kid's sword that folds up inside of itself and you go to like you know draw your sword and the sword comes out that's what our actin myosin cross bridgings are doing on the deeper physiology of our muscles is they're actually tunneling inside of themselves um, to lengthen it so there's a there's a certain level of your own fascial flossing that is just movement. Right. But if that muscle, so within itself, but if the superficially around that muscle, it's developed cross bridges to the one beside it, it's, it will move just pulled a little bit to the right. So that's where foam rolling and mobility balls and instrument assisted stuff comes in. You know, when you think about like why instrument assisted, um, you know, it, again, it just becomes like mechanics. My, my hand is, my, my fingers are this amount wide and I got to get into this micro level of a muscle adhesion to kind of pick it apart and stuff. Well, if I had this surgical stainless steel thing with an edge on it, I could probably do a better job than that than my hand. Right. So again, it's one of these things where, you know, there's no tool better than the person using it. Right. <laughs> so the tool is an extension of what you know and it's just a tool. It's like here. You've probably heard this where we, where we both grew up and come from, and right. it was, you know, it's, it's the Indian, not the arrow. Right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I, was, I was telling Julie, right, you know, I'm helping uh, 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 one of her sons learn how to drive a tractor, and he's eight years old, and he's doing a great job. And how I grew up, like, I, was, I remember getting yelled at if I wasn't backing the tractor up correctly with the wood trailer behind it to the wood pile, like, you know you counter steer to get it over here. <laughs> you know, so there's a, a just a certain, uh, responsibility that it would be, you know, cooler if a little more people like were, especially with their medicine and their health mm -hmm. in today's uh, world training. And most people hurt themselves with their own training, their own movement. Yeah. Um, so talk about the difference between 
soft tissue mobilization and self myofascial release, what, what Beautiful. we would normally think of as like foam rolling. Yeah. Okay. So soft tissue uh, mobilization from a practitioner standpoint is once I find all these adhesions in and around your structure, um, if we just keep it at that, I'm just going to go get each one of those out and you're going to lay there and you're not going to have muscle contractions and you're not going to be moving and I'm, it's just soft, supple, not uh, tense muscle that I'm breaking it apart and stuff. So then when you, and that's a very precise, I have a tool in my hand that I'm right on this adhesion. So surface contact area of tool to surface contact area of skin uh, is much more pressure finite oriented with uh, with iStem tools. If you're on a foam roller and it's a six inch foam roller, think about just surface distribution of pressure. So foam rolling is actually a great warm up for iStem. Okay. Because you're, you're actually just general, general fascia, open it up. I'm catching this much of the stuff at a time, right. but did you really get in there and pick apart that adhesion? Because right. you know, it's a knot. So when you get into the collagen formation of, uh, and real quick, just since we're talking about IT band stuff, remember guys, there's no such thing as rolling out your IT band. Your IT band is made of dense, irregular collagen, which means cross bridges go in every direction. It is just a cable that's supposed to be lateral stability kind of out there. When we have experienced an open IT band, I, I did quotes with my fingers since it's a podcast. <laughs> the, so what we're doing is we're, we're, we're not actually breaking up stuff on the band, but- We're breaking it apart the, from, from vastus lateralis and hand. biceps femoris right. on the, on the right. lateral side. Yes, sir, you got it. Okay. I love people who know their anatomy. It's been a while. I know it's hamstring. I forgot those <laughs> biceps from Morris. Yeah. Um, so, is there? Uh, I guess do we run the risk of if if all people are doing is foam rolling? It, do they run the risk of you know? potentially doing more harm than good, or are there right ways, wrong ways to approach that? Yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. So it's like one of the greatest things is that, um, you know, it's uh, within a certain level of professional, if you've ran into some people doing biomechanical motor sequencing stuff, they're gonna talk about Vladimir Yonda, upper cross syndrome, lower cross syndrome. So if you were to look at your body, and you know, Ryan and I had some uh, deeper conversations about this of, you know, there's no, we're not stacked. We use the word stacked when we talk about our posture, but if you really you know, knew your anatomy, no two bones are stacked on top of each other until you have bone on bone osteoarthritis of your knee and the bones are touching each other. Like, I really want you to slow your minds down here and really think about the bones are floating in the muscles, because they are. They're not stacked on top of one another. There's approximation everywhere. When you run out of approximation, you're in trouble. We need to replace your joint. So you're actually floating inside your muscles walking around Chew on that for a few hours. <laughs> so how do you position your skeleton inside of your muscles? Now that affects how I actually move three-dimensionally here on the ground, affected by gravity, all that good stuff. And that's stuff. where you used the word align, and that's where I said earlier, oh, you gotta check out this guy here. Yeah, so, yeah. You're so, welcome for the plugs, Aaron. Yeah, so yeah, so we don't wanna be stacked. We wanna be aligned. You know, so if you look, so then are we doing more damage sometimes? If in Vladimir Yonda's lower cross syndrome, the, the person is gonna uh, complain of tight hamstrings that need to be stretched. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, those people sit a lot, they have desk jobs, and that for 10 hours a day, they're shortening their hip flexors. So when they stand up, the pelvis is stuck in an anteriorly tipped position, lengthening the hamstrings. Okay, so again, this is us interpreting our own bodies. So now the hamstrings are being pulled on, so they have a hypotonicity. They're actually trying to pull back, but they're too long and stringy to do it. They're kind of under a passive insufficiency kind of state. Now the rectus femoris, iliopsoas, quadriceps are hypertonic, they are short and tight, but my hamstrings are the ones sending the signal. The signal that they're sending is take pressure off of me. We interpret that as stretch because based on where we are right now, that's the only way we know how to take pressure off of it. Right, and that's, I mean, that's the same feeling that we would experience if they were short and tight and needed to be stretched. Take pressure off of me, right? right? Whether it's a bulky pressure or a long stringy pressure. So where would we do damage to ourselves? Well, if uh, that person goes, I need to stretch my hamstrings, and they are like crushing their hamstrings, stretching them out, rolling on a ball, hamstring, 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 they're actually just ratcheting your pelvis more into an anteriorly tipped position and your back is gonna keep hurting worse. So two, two parts to this question then. How do they tell if that's in fact what's going on? And two, what should they do instead of continuing to stretch the hamstring? Practice self-awareness. <laughs> if they can't come into Evo Strong and hang out with Yeah, yeah, I love it, I love it. I mean, you guys have been picked up on this already. Like, 
if there's somebody out there who can talk biomechanics and Eastern energy and stuff like that, as well as Scott, I want to meet them and I want to have them on the show. So if you know of them, <laughs> put them in touch with me. We'll get them on the show. But, so, so, so what, like a serious answer, right? So yeah. it's like, so what needs to happen then is that we need to realign and reposition the pelvis. So you will actually do, uh, that's another question on the Epic test. I gotta quit giving all these answers to the Epic test, man. Like this is gonna become a big product now. It's yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> if he was gonna be cheat sheeting all my podcasts, he'd be like, he's telling the answers on his podcast. That's it. <laughs> so if you come in, this is uh, for the coaches. They say, hey, I sit, I drive to work. I sit at the desk. My hamstrings are always, you know, uh, killing them. I say, you're fired if you give him a hamstring stretch. Now, again, I'm making a joke here, guys. It, inevitably, or or ultimately your hamstrings do need stretched out also, but order of operations is real important here because part of that tension is because my pelvis is out of a line. So you need to dig into rectus femoris, iliopsoas, uh, quadriceps, and you need to loosen all of that fascia up, stretch that fascia, fascia. Now, just like you and I were talking about, about if all I do is treat that fascia, if I don't program my glutes to kick on first to now lengthen this up top, take the pressure off the hamstrings, all I did was stretch out the front. Now, usually when you try to, you know, uh, I gotta get into the body a lot of times to get to, to accept my work. So I use um, reciprocal inhibition, I use proprioceptive response, and then I like Trojan horse it into the body and it's like, ah, now I'm in, tricked you. Um, so if we get the quads and anterior fascial chain to loosen up the hypotonicity in that like, give me some stuff back of the hamstrings will actually start to pull that pelvis back into alignment. You're gonna be like, oh man, my back feels so much better. My hamstrings are calmed down, but I worked on the front of my legs. Mm -hmm. So that's what you should do. Right. Yep. And could they do that as simply as just like smashing to, to steal something from K-Star? Sure. Or uh, foam rolling the, the front of the leg? It's, you know, when you, when you get out there, like I said, I, I developed Epic because I needed a little more knowledge into the people that worked here. So if you're just going to try to help the masses like K-Star has, you, you know, we're simplifying stuff here, guys. Right. You know, so it's, if you were to do pre and post, uh, you know, control group, not control group, one group foam rolled and stretched, other group uh, didn't foam roll and just stretched. I think this actually research exists out there. It's not on the top of my head now, but it's out there. Um, this group, if it's, because now you got the, well, did you give them any instruction or does it, was it just like a monkey in a football? Right. <laughs> if we know that old analogy. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you, there's a little bit of some technique here, you know, where it's, uh, I, here in Winchester, I've been here six years and there was about three years in a row, I ask every high school student who would come through um, as a personal client or a member, hey, have you had anatomy yet? And I got one answer out of three years of asking high school students, how do we not teach each other this thing we're living inside of right. and what the muscles are? It's only if you wanna be a healthcare professional, like it's some coveted piece of knowledge. Yeah. So it's like, you know, educate yourselves yeah. about muscle and what you're doing with that foam roller and what you're doing with this, this, and this, uh, because you can cause damage and you can do stuff or you could end up uh, maybe a little bit worse. Like there was a, uh, this one went around here years ago before all this podcast stuff where, you, you know, before you and I remember when there wasn't an internet, right. right? So there was a guy, he did like, I sat in a sauna and I stretched my hamstrings. I sat in a sauna, I stretched my hamstrings. I sat in my sauna, stretched my hamstrings for like six, eight weeks. And he like blogged it back then. And I told you stretching doesn't work. You can't get a knot out of a rope by pulling harder on a rope. You can warm it up as much as you want to, and you can yank on that knot as much as you want to. He needed some ostium tools. He needed some this, right? Or he had an anteriorly tipped pelvis and he needed to be stretching his hip flexors. Right. <laughs> I just wanted to talk to that guy and be like, bro, we'll set you straight. You had some reach, you had some power to influence people, and you, you messed it up, man. Right. <laughs> All right, so, so if, if somebody listening thinks that they, if, if they're saying, oh, that's, that's me. Okay, yep. Is there a self-diagnosis tool or, or test that they can do to say like, I have anterior pelvic tilt. So if you right. just stand sideways, it's like just have your shorts around your hips, stand side, stand in front of a full length mirror sideways and look if the front part of your shorts are lower than the back part of your shorts. That's really simple. <laughs> That's really simple. <laughs> uh, caught me off guard. I was expecting something more complicated than that. Yeah, no, that's well, great. You, like you said, you got to get people usable information. Yeah, no, you that's know? great. Uh, one of the cues I used to use in the gym was, uh, I got this from a, from a coach, a uh, wrestling coach in the area that he used to, uh, to tell his guys this, but take your belt buckle to your chin. Okay. 
Yeah, it just makes people kind of do that and yeah. pull in, pull up, or tuck, your or tuck your tailbone, right? And that you're using your glutes uh, when you do that. And if you're getting some femoral external rotation, we get into the obturators and the, uh, you know, those deeper rotator cuff of the hip. We have a rotator cuff of the hip that's never really talked about because it's just scarred down in everybody and it doesn't work correctly. <laughs> so we just kind of said, uh, we're yeah. The yeah. With it it's yeah, it's it, in 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 school. It's actually memorized as like the P go go cues for like piriformis, gemella superior, gemellus in, inferior, and then obturator in internus, externus, so, and then quadratus and more. So you use p go cues But no, those are really important. Those actually position your, your right. hip before big motor movement happens. Yeah, piriformis is right. a big one. Well, this is why hammer strength machines, you know, the, my facility here is why it gets confused with the CrossFit box. Now, we're not sitting here hating on CrossFit. I love the sport of CrossFit, but it is a sport, right? right? Training science has been around forever, right? Uh, I do metabolic conditioning here based on metabolic conditioning, right? We talk about the whole aerobic system, fast glycolysis, slow glycolysis, which muscle fiber type in my athletes am I trying to build? Those athletes might be great at the sport of CrossFit, but it's not CrossFit. You see what I'm saying? It's like they just kind of, it's where they've uh, made a little enemies in the world. They overstep some things a little bit, but love, I mean, dude, it's there's like, you know, Rich Fronning's an animal. Some of the athletes are just impressive, impressive. Love the sport. Let's just be real about some of the other stuff, right. you know. Um, hammer strength machines get you to, so I don't have any hammer strength machines in my facility. They'll never be in here. Uh, if you are listening and you work out at a Globo gym on hammer strength machines, keep going to your Globo gym. That's fine. Just stop using the machines so they get rid of them and buy free weights, right? Stability is more important than strength. Why would I want to be strong and powerful in a limb that I can't stabilize? That's called a rotator cuff tear or a dislocated shoulder at that point. So when we sit down to a hammer strength machine with a fixed arm that's holding the weight, I now use muscles that were meant for maybe another task as gross motor movements, or I just use my big motor movers, like my pecs and my lats and my delts, without articulating my shoulder in its capsule before that movement happens, because the machine is holding the weights for me. So no matter how many pivot points and no matter how natural they try to make it, the machine is holding and balancing the weight for you. You and I could go push my truck 4,000 pounds up and down this parking lot. Does that mean we can actually move 4,000 pounds? You know, like the earth's holding it and balancing it for us. We're just pushing it. Yeah. And, and we've got that invention in the wheel. Yeah, that's helping, us. that's helping us, you know, right? So there was, um, so again, I just try to educate people on that. You know, I don't have, um, there'll never be hammer strength machines here. They're just not healthy for you guys. They're not. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's talk about recovery. I love it. you are six weeks into your own recovery. Yeah. A um, little bit of background. Uh, yeah. You've got the, the Achilles rupture. Sure. So yeah, it's definitely something to speak to because it's been like some of my own self growth. Uh, this is my seventh major surgery. Um, a lot of my stuff is, you know, Ryan and I grew up uh, and a lot of listeners also, right? Like remember behind the neck seated military press is a standard. Right. And then we know like, that was kind of bad for some stuff. And then especially with a uh, narrow grip. <laughs> yeah, especially, it's right? one thing if you've got a snatch grip. Yeah, sure. On healthy shoulders. But. Yeah, well we do, you know, like we'll do uh, 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 like snatch drops and then like catch behind your neck again. Again, different stuff. Right. Uh, just to, uh, I, I'm actually glad you made that point because so many people love to be in a camp and then overstate something. Yeah. I'm, I am very impeccable with my word. I'm talking about that example, the thing. Right. So it was awesome of Ryan to actually point out there's other actually ways. So most of the time it's like, we just had to change it a little bit. Right. You know, just to like some biomechanical standards. Right. <laughs> right. So when, um, we're looking at, what were we talking about? I lost there for a second. Achilles. Achilles, right, that, that whole thing. Yeah, well, but so a lot of that is because I grew up training wrong. Right. I, I ran 160 steps a minute in ASICs with a heel strike, and I didn't understand what was going on or anything wrong with that. I was uh, always performed well, could do obstacle course races, could, you know, mountain bike, snowboard, train, until my left Achilles just ruptured. And um, the left Achilles uh, ruptured probably nine, 10 years ago or something. And uh, that happened uh, probably six months after I was diagnosed with Lyme disease back then. So uh, I was on deoxycycline for a month. Uh, Cipro has a black box label on it. Deoxycycline is in a similar class that can still weaken tendons. And then Lyme disease itself can weaken your tendons across time. So 
ruptured my left Achilles tendon, and I'm uh, sincerely thankful that that happened because it was like five years after that, I'm uh, lecturing as a quote unquote running expert and it put me down the rabbit hole of all this stuff of like now we both wear limbs and now that. So first surgery was when I was in peewee football, some cartilage in my knee, got tackled from the side, nothing to do about that. When I was 19, dislocated my left shoulder, uh, fractured my clavicle, had actually a grade five AC joint sprain. Most people would think there's just three. Well, there's three vertical. There's two other gnarly ones where it's like real convoluted. So my clavicle was sitting on top of my scapula back here. Oh. Yeah, so then there was that surgery and uh, some not so great rehab after that. And I have, um, this one was again, shit happens. Like no matter how well you move, you can be driving to the hole playing basketball and jump stop on sweat or water and the dude guarding you can jump stop on the same sweat or water and when you slide into each other one of the two people's knees dislocates because of just impact force because we hit water um, so basketball injuries such as those were responsible for my next two surgeries of just crap happens on a playing sport sometimes it's a physical game right. someone tackles you from the side you can tear your MCL so actually on that one I uh, my femur um, pushed into my tibia and drug the medial meniscus off of the tibial plateau. So, um, you know, we talked about my 440 mile on a Ben Greenfield podcast. Uh, I ran that after all these surgeries. So I don't have a medial meniscus. They had to take it out. Okay. So I use a lot of, like I have a rule, my left knee doesn't go into valgus and I use the whole proprioceptive response and stability training in my left glute to keep it there. Um, I have a disc bulge, I have degenerative disc disease in my neck from some, uh, you know, uh, growing up. Uh, I learned how to water ski when I was seven, then got into kneeboarding, wakeboarding. Um, so, you know, I got a whole history of just having fun on the planet here. Right. And uh, I've suffered some consequences of that. So now, uh, six weeks ago, uh, my right Achilles just kind of ruptured uh, with no warning, no, I was just shooting basketball and tried to plant and run really quick. I wasn't even playing. So it's, uh, we're looking at you know, maybe tests for collagen, reticulin, elastin distribution, um, but I don't meet hyperlaxity standards. I move well, I foam roll and stuff all the time. So it kind of goes back to maybe that Lyme disease diagnosis and like just because that unfortunately happened to me, you know. So that's, that's currently where I'm at right now. So yeah, I'm six weeks after that, but uh, I'm pretty well ahead of the game right now. Okay, now you've been sipping on a, a shake most of the morning. Yeah. And I told you I was gonna ask you about it on the podcast. Yep. So run us through the ingredients. You got it. Uh, and, and how that's helping you because you, you've, you are well ahead of the, I guess, normal or average yeah. recovery, right. which yeah. we've already established that maybe that's not uh, normal or average. Sure. But, how are you sort of supercharging your recovery? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. So I definitely got to uh, uh, give my lady, Julie, props for the smoothie. I have uh, my own version of the smoothie, which is just more ATP energy-based. And you know, so we're, dry, we're trying to grow a tendon right now. Like how about food as fuel, food as nutrients. I'm trying to grow a tendon. What do I need to do that? If you're gonna build a brick wall, you might want some bricks. Right, so. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> right, so you know, there's a like uh, in the whole blood. So the whey protein, just a good clean source of whey protein. You shouldn't be able to not pronounce anything in it, and there should just be about three or four ingredients. You know, if you're if you're really trying to trim it down, right. Um, then uh, number two ingredient is uh, bone collagen, right, because of the. Uh, really amino acid nucleotide stuff because that's really where we're going to be building, you know, tendons and bone health and, and reconstructing everything. Then we need energy for that. So there's also brain octane XCT oil, uh, which are, XCT oil is capric and caprylic medium chain triglycerides. Brain octane is just the caprylic because that's like the most bomb one. The body really, really loves that one for optimal function, ATP development. Uh, then there's coconut oil, um, almond butter, uh, kale, because you need some iron, right? There's wheatgrass. Um, wheatgrass uh, there's uh, frozen cherries for antioxidants. Um, cacao powder. There's a, you know, there's just some uh, more antioxidants and awesome stuff in that. Uh, oh, there's chia seeds. There's chia seeds in there. I have a cheat sheet. She's whispering to me off out of frame here. There's chia in it also. Tell them about the chia, right? So uh, there's that's a, a blend. <laughs> A blend and a mix of like kind of all that stuff. So then I'm even biohacking it even further to where it's like I will have that um, as I'm actually sitting in an ice bath or pre ice bath. Then I'll take an ice bath. I do Wim Hof training, uh, pranayama yoga. So then as I suck all the inflammation and stuff out of my extremities into my core, um, you know, so I'm taking out any of the restrictive pathways because those adhesions and too much inflammation can actually physically restrict the capillary. That'll get back into some ice stem work there. So now that I've actually had that, I've sucked all the inflammation out of it, 
now when I when the blood is actually going back into that area that just had all of the you know water response inflammation response everything sucked out of it you know the cells are going to be wanting some stuff and I just had everything you need to build an Achilles tendon right. so now my blood is carrying those nutrients into there so that's like biohacking the healing process so it's six weeks I got limbs on and I'm actually you know taking some steps and you can actually feel where the tendons growing back in um, like I said, we're not, uh, we still got a lot to learn, guys, myself included, about how to really make this thing cooler than we know it right now. Yeah, uh, so that, that's an awesome hack. I think, I guess the, the take home for folks listening is, you know, if you've got an injury, figure out what raw materials you need to repair it, put those things in a recovery shape, ingest them so that you actually have them. <laughs> but then there are things that you can do with the ice yeah. that will actually you know, direct blood flow to carry those nutrients to that area. I'm doing manual therapy and stuff afterwards also. Like I'm, I'm doing, um, so back in the 20s, we had Dr. Syriax, James Syriax. Um, he's a guy that father of orthopedic medicine. He came up with cross friction massage. So we know that um, Hot Grips is actually part of some really cool research on this where they took uh, rat tendons and cut them. And then as they're healing back together, uh, you know, one group doesn't have eye stem tool work. The other group does have eye stem tool work. Cross friction massage on healing tendons with a 30,000 time microscopic uh, camera is shooting the collagen as it is realigning. Um, and this is one, I could get it to you if you wanted to put a link to it, uh, because you can actually, there's pictures of this knot of the collagen like this in the group that's not getting eye stem. Wow. In the group that's getting eye stem, you see perfect parallel alignment happening of the collagen fibers. That's crazy. So I'm sure not only does that speed recovery, but it also probably reduces incidence of future injury. You have extensibility again. Again, right. you can't get a knot out of a rope and pulling harder on the rope. You're going to re-rupture something again. Yeah. So while I'm giving it the nutrient stuff that it needs. I'm actually shaping it. I'm actually doing tool work to tell, you know, really good practitioners. Uh, I'm actually talking to the cells. Like me and fibroblasts are tight. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love this. This is awesome. Uh, all right. So, yeah, if you can give me that, I'd love to include that on the yeah. show notes for. I, got, I have it on my laptop. Yeah. Okay. Um, did we miss anything? Uh, so. We were talking about, you know, my injuries and how I've kind of really enhanced that process. Um, so then really just back into the Qigong work and stuff again, man. So it's like, you know, we, we mess so much stuff up with all this open chain movement. Open chain movement's good, but think about any- Explain the difference, open and close. Beautiful, so open chain movement, uh, more official, is that the distal part of my extremity, so my arm or my leg, my hand is what's just moving in the air. Right? So if I'm just like taking my arm up over my head, that is an open kinetic chain movement. If I'm going to take my leg and swing it, the leg swinging is an open chain. But if I have both feet on the ground and I squat and I push and I stand back up, that's a closed kinetic chain movement because the distal part of my limb stayed fixed and the proximal section of it moved on a fixed distal. So that's the definition of closed kinetic chain. Closed kinetic chain, we can elicit a proprioceptive response which can also increase my kinesthetic awareness of my ability to feel where my body is in space. So that when I'm doing, when I, when I'm, when I'm doing uh, closed kinetic chain exercises, and if people are, because you we were asking me earlier about like what can people do? So stand barefoot, stand barefoot, stand on one foot, think balance, and watch all the little micro variations and stuff that goes on when your actual foot is moving and doing stuff. That's a proprioceptive response. All you're thinking is balance, and that's happening. So once I'm doing the nutrients and I'm doing the soft tissue work, now I'm doing that whole neurological thing where as this tendon is regrowing, I am maintaining proprioceptive response right along with it. Right. So if you know volume control as a, you know, little bit down the road practitioner of healing, um, you can actually do stuff way earlier in said protocol than most orthopedic surgeons would tell you you could. Right. Because I know how much pressure are you going to put on there? Yeah. With, with the we're not back squatting two two twenty here, guy. I'm, we're, but we're going to start some close connect chain stuff. <laughs> and so like, and I guess to, to crystallize that as an example for people, like uh, a push up versus a bench press. Yeah. Right. Yeah, totally. Push up would be closed chain. Bench press would be open chain. Uh, one hundred percent. Okay. Yeah, and and uh, 
if you put, if you bench press correctly and you're driving through your heels as part of it, because that's how we load our spine. Right. So, but we, you, you really have to get into a deeper level yeah, of it for those that are out there. In case there's like five people that are like, well, Internet you know, <laughs> yes, bench press, this is moving, push up, the body moves away from it. That's a great example. Right. <laughs> um, Internet warriors, yeah. <laughs> all right, so last two questions for you, Scott. Uh, number one, where can our listeners get more of you? Uh, yeah, so right now it's, uh, like I said, this is uh, sixth year in business. This is my third facility. 1,500 square feet, outgrew it. 4,000 square feet, outgrew it. Now I'm in 10,000 square feet. Uh, probably the fourth website's being developed right now. So if you go to uh, evolutionhpr.com, um, there is, you know, it is, it's, it's up and it's doing. There's going to be a video section. There's already a ketogenic research uh, resource section. Um, and so that's where there's going to be a ton of come check out video. Like we probably have a library of over 200 videos that is prepped for the development to launch. So it is gonna be like this, this not this trickle in one at a time. It's just gonna be like, boom. So it's, it's our fourth website. Yeah. You know, we've been in the new facility for a year now. So then getting all that going on the back end is what's what's been happening. So the website is always great. And then, uh, you know, Facebook message, call our facility. At, at this point, uh, we are very accustomed and used to people flying in to work with me. It's um, we've It's been a very humbling thing to get used to, but we're used to it, it happens often. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, if somebody was interested in doing that, I guess they'd fly into Dulles. They'd fly into Dulles. Yep. Yeah. We're about 45 minutes from Dulles, and we have a Holiday Inn, a Courtyard Marriott, right across the street from us. So that's actually pretty pretty convenient. I also write for Martial Arts Illustrated magazine. Uh, that goes out to about 400,000 subscribers around the world. So those are like um, those are just articles. So actually, I'm having a lot of fun writing those. Like uh, the first one was Train How You Move. It talks about the whole sequence, and I, I point out that if your shoulders in a certain position, I can show you how you can generate half as much force or twice as much force just by putting you in the different position with your shoulder. So, so that's a whole push-up kind of thing, upper trap dominant. Um, and then there's uh, the second one. Uh, there's another one called You Don't Know Squat, which is just a, a fun title on here's squat. And if you don't air squat right, then why are you even picking up a weight? Right. You don't, you're, you're, you're going to hurt something. You might get strong along the way, but that knee's going to suck one day. Right. You, and then, um, you know, so then I wrote another one on like fascial eye stem stuff. So it's like one a month, guys. So that's just like me and some of my headspace coming out. That, that, that's like a publication you can kind of get some more of me in. Ben Greenfield Fitness, there's some exposure there. Part of the event, Runga, and uh, it's been in Costa Rica the first two years with Jody Stefana. So now this year it's in uh, Cosmutal, Panama. It's Sansara Surf Retreat. So you guys can go to Sansara's website right now. It's called Runga. There's still spaces week two of that. And the, Ben Greenfield there, I'm there. Joe from Spartan Race. Um, Chris Russ from Tough Training. It is really just a week or two weeks of like how to be an optimal human. Like, let's get out. Let's we, we have a cell phone. We're like, put your cell phones say, away. It's, and it's a uh, technology detox too, right? Correct. Yeah. It's like, we don't understand. Like, so right now, you know, you can look on the periphery of the perimeter. There's still the old fluorescence I'm getting rid of. I've spent thousands of dollars on these lights. We're under blue light spectrum right now. You know what? That's actually one of the questions I have that I knew there was something I was forgetting. Um, Talk to us about the lighting in here. Yep. So then when in the treatment room, if like if you can see where we're at right now, you just look into the treatment room. Like see how it's like an orange glow. Mm -hmm. So in the treatment rooms, I have an orange light spectrum light so that that actually picks up your melatonin, relaxes you a little bit, uh, might get a little more sleepy like or just relax. And then out here on the floor, it's blue light spectrum to turn down melatonin, pick up your mood, enhance thinking, wake you up so you actually perform and pay attention better. Do you worry about like, so let's say it was the winter months yep. and somebody was coming in here to train at 6 or 7 p.m. Right. Do you worry about them uh, possibly jacking up their uh, circadian rhythm if they're exposed to this uh, while training at you know 7 p.m. Yeah, it's dark I, outside? Awesome question. But on, on the flip side of that, if they don't come in here and train, they're probably sitting under blue lights at home and not getting, you know, movement. Yeah, or it's, training. it's, it's kind of one of those things because then once you get into once you're like this kind of person who's into all this stuff, at what point does it, is it really, really different? You know, it's like, right. you know, Ben, I love it at his house, you know, he doesn't have the, uh, there's no Wi-Fi because it's, you know, you gotta like, you'll plug a, you'll plug a cord and it goes 30 feet to a wall because, but the rest of everywhere else and he goes, he's dealing with Wi-Fi and he's dealing with all that stuff. So we're talking about optimal. We're talking about optimizing in this world we live in, you know, so not, I don't want to be a bubble boy. I want to go have some ice cream sometimes, even though I have a mostly hi-fi diet. <laughs> so at 7 p.m., you would look at how much of an exposure to something affected that person's circadian rhythm that they have, right? There's the whole, uh, Dave Asprey does a lot of writing on what is your chronotype, yeah. right? So uh, me and Dave got about the same type of chronotype. Like my rock star focus is 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. 
and then I just get up a little bit later, but I just roll in that, I really do. So for me, 7 p.m. blue light exposure wouldn't make any difference. I'm like, cool, let's roll. Right. But for someone else who's trying to maybe doing that early, early to rise, early to bed, yeah, you might, they, they might be one of those people that come in, they're like, man, I'm just like, I work out and I have so much energy afterwards, like I might have to find a different thing. Right. And it's like, uh, yeah, so then I would give instructions like don't watch TV when you go home, um, don't stare at your iPhone or put it, like we would just try to uh, counteract that the best that we could, but you know, I wouldn't want them sleepy here on the floor working out necessarily, like, right. you know, so yeah, but it's still an awesome question because it, to, to understand, because you know, most people are just like, ah, oh, who cares, your lights. I'm like, ah, oh, you got no idea, man. You well, know? And I think that speaks to the way you've looked at this facility as a whole. Like, right. You know, I asked you what you envisioned because you said you're still in phase two of the build out. What yep. does phase three look like? I mean, you, you, you know, for people who aren't here and aren't seeing this, I mean, the, the floor, you know, Scott did his own floor. He did the tiles in the bathroom. Like, I mean, he did everything himself and, and what you've put into this, what you're creating here is, you know, it, it's one of the ultimate biohacked facilities, if you want to call sure. it that. But I mean, you, you, Everything was aware or intentional. There, there was nothing done by accident or by default, which, again, is in line with what you were saying earlier. Yeah. Well, pe aware. people ask me, they're like, "How's it feel?" You know, when I got it done, I'm like, "It's, it's, uh, again, not. It, it, I'm not." So many people are like, "Oh, you don't even know." I don't really like when people say you don't even know with that vibe. I don't think it's very attractive. So it's just like, but this is one where it's like it's really hard to communicate right. because in this day and age, you pay a designer, then you pay a contractor, then you have a turnkey spot that feels great when you get to it. Uh, I designed it, I built it, and I walk into it and I work every day. So it's, um, it really is, you know, when you look at uh, one of your podcasts or one of your articles was about the uh, one guy who helps uh, high level entrepreneurs optimize their vision. Yeah. Uh, I'm optimizing my, I am living my passion and I've built my surroundings around of it, kind of like what Joel talks about also. Yeah. You're right. So it's like, you know, there's a lot of these pieces of just uh, how my brain's even connecting dots from a, me just watching you of like, you just see these pieces and you're like, yeah, that stuff. Yeah, that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, Scott and I were geeking out earlier on pattern recognition. Um, all right. Scott, last question. Yes, sir. Your top three tips to live optimal. Top three tips to live optimal. Uh, Self-awareness is absolutely the top one. And that is, it, it, people's like, okay, I'm aware of myself. Like everyone listening right now, think about your pinky toe. How does it feel? How does your pinky toe feel every day? Do you know? Have you asked? Have you checked in? <laughs> Understand that there's a much deeper level of uh, self-awareness that goes on, uh, especially with mood and reactions and, and, and then even just relationship communications. It's like if something is a hot button issue or if you are just a little more pissy at a certain part of the day, like start asking yourself why. Start becoming aware that I get a little hangry at a certain time and then instead of accepting that as normal, why don't we go, I don't like that that happens sometimes. Why can't I just be hungry and be cool with it? Right, so there's a whole depth of self-awareness we could get into where just real quickly, I say self-awareness, but guys, there's a level there. Um, multiple levels. Multiple levels. If you looked at food and movement as like you were here on a rock flying through the universe, food and movement is medicine. Mm -hmm. So self-awareness, eat really good, and move right. I love it. <laughs> you guys listening, uh, we will have links to everything that Scott mentioned, studies, uh, people, tools, uh, links to all of the places where you can get more of him, cool. uh, the gym, uh, the gym's phone number, social media, all that stuff. Uh, that's all going to be at naturalstacks.com. Go check out the blog post there. Um, as always, go to iTunes, leave us a five-star review. That really does help us uh, get higher rankings. It helps more people see the show and that in turn helps us reach more people as does your sharing the podcast. So when you heard Scott talk today, as you listen to this one or as you kind of wind down now, anybody that you know in your life, friends or family who will benefit from the things that we have talked about, share this podcast with them. There's a little uh, share link on wherever you listen, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iTunes, all of them. Grab that link, share it on social media, email, text, whatever. Greatly appreciate that. And we thank you for spending some time with us today. Thanks for being here. Scott, thank you, man. This has been amazing. Uh, it's been awesome to meet you, Ryan. Love to connect with uh, other like-minded individuals that are doing it. It always feels good.